Hi, everyone. My name is Matt. I just gave this talk at PyDot New York City. It was super fun. We had a bunch of developers working on the numbers before the conference, at the conference. Then we gave the talk. Really good audience participation. I wanted to give it here online first uh, before the videos came out. They'll come out a couple months, but honestly, the numbers will be out of date by then. So uh, the, the title of the talk is Spark, Dask, DuckDB, and Polars, TPCH Benchmarks at Scale, also on the cloud. Uh, the tagline is the battle that no one wins. So these are all great libraries to do large scale sort of data frame, database computing. Uh, and they all work in different ways, in different fashions, and they all perform differently at different contexts. I'm gonna sort of explore that space. So today we're gonna see lots of charts. I'm gonna show charts that look kind of like this, where we're looking at a certain uh, benchmark query set, TPCH, on both cloud and local at various scales. And we're gonna sort of page through them and we're gonna see that they perform differently on these different contexts. And then we'll explore why or how they do well or poorly. It'll help us understand what tool to use when. Um, so again, should be fun. Uh, before we do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some background generally. Uh, we'll go through the charts, what it has showed. We'll then talk through some analysis, figuring out why things are slow, what's the bottleneck, what's fast, what's bad, and what how projects can improve also. And at the end, I'll sort of give uh, to talk about how I deployed all of this, which would be a, a mild sales pitch for Coiled. Uh, I work for Coiled. Coiled is like the Dask company, or is a company about Dask, um, but we do lots of different things. Um, so uh, if you don't want to listen to this talk, and you just want to look at numbers, uh, all of the charts that I showed are at tpch.coiled.io. So you can go look at that instead if you like. Okay, so first, background. Background. Um, these are four libraries. I should also mention first Pandas, right? Pandas is by far the standard tool that has had more impact on all these libraries combined. Everyone loves or hates Pandas, depending on how much you've, you've used it. It's a great tool, has had huge social impact. It's not designed to run at 10 terabyte scale on the cloud. So we're not going to include it in these benchmarks. Um, the exception is kind of being included inside of Dask. So uh, Spark, de facto standard. Dask, actually sort of a general purpose library parallel computing, not really a data frame library. But one of the APIs inside of Dask is Dask plus Pandas, Dask data frame. We're going to focus on that today. Then there, so those are both distributed systems. Uh, on the bottom, there are single machine systems that have emerged more recently, DuckDB and Polars. DuckDB is more of a sort of standard uh, SQL database. Polars is more of a data frame library. All of these libraries are great. All of them have use cases and users that love them or hate them. Uh, they're all great. Um, I am biased a little bit towards Dask. That's where I come from. Uh, and just a brief history with Dask and benchmarks. I actually hate benchmarks normally. Usually when people deliver benchmarks, They've like optimized the benchmarks to their library. They don't think about at all about the other libraries and they deliver charts that look like this. This is, um, uh, we also usually Dask sucks at benchmarks. We're not really optimized for performance. We try pretty hard to be um, the like easy to use and flexible library rather than the lightning fast library. Um, but so this is a chart taken from the Polar's website where they look at uh, the same set of queries we're gonna look at today, actually TPCH. And you know, Dask and Pandas are these sort of blue and, and red, red lines up here, which sort of take a very long time. So historically, Dask has sucked at benchmarks. If you like want your library to look good, you like compare it against Dask, because Dask has a lot of users and does really poorly at benchmarks. Um, but recently, Dask Data Frame, this Dask and Pandas library, made a bunch of changes. Um, so we added, so Pandas added arrow strings, which like massively improves memory performance. Uh, copy on write in pandas, although well, we're not including that today. And then Dask also included sort of new sorting and joining algorithms with a new shuffling system and query optimization. These four changes actually dramatically affect Dask data frame performance at large scale data frame, like complex queries. I'm not gonna go into these. Uh, if you want, uh, my colleague Patrick Hoefler gave a great talk about these four features also at PyDot of New York. So though that, that talk should be online soon. But needless to say, just uh, pandas and Dask are fast-ish now, much more so than they were before. As a brief example of that, we're gonna look at a quick video. This is showing off one of those features, the new shuffling sort join system. 
And on the right is the old system, and on the left is the new system. This is the Dask dashboard. It shows you how Dask runs in parallel. And on the right, we're going to see a few things. We're going to see these progress bars march forward. So they're going to march forward slightly faster on the, on the new system on the left and slightly slower on the old system on the right. We're also going to see memory use. So here it's sort of sort of you know 30% memory use on the old system and actually pretty constrained memory use on the new system. And these numbers on the right are going to march forward and they're going to get sort of unpleasant in a bit. On the right, on the old system, we're also seeing a lot of really exciting activity. That's actually a little bit scary. As a Dask person, if you see a lot of red, if you see a lot of this white space, it's concerning. On the left side, we see just sort of steady marching forward. So it looks really boring, which is nice. So now on the right, we're seeing um, you know, a lot of orange and memory. We're sort of getting past where Dask is comfortable with memory. It's kind of unpleasant. And on the left, super steady, super boring, just marching forwards calmly. This is showing again just sort of one of those changes in how sort of new DAS data frame is different from old DAS data frame. It's super stable, it's fast, it operates in low memory at any size of data. And that's new and that's fun. And we're sort of excited about those changes. There are roughly four changes of equal import that have happened in the last few months. So DAS data frame is now sort of um, significantly different than it was even just a few months ago. So, okay. So Pandas and Dask are fast now, in fact, boringly so. They are so fast, they are now boring in their performance, which is, I think, a good place to be as a sort of data frame database library. And that's new, and that's fun. So we wanted to run, so we wanted to see how well we did across these benchmarks that we've always been really bad at. Honestly, our goal was be, you know, less than 10 times worse than Spark. That was kind of where we were aiming. Uh, and it was actually surprisingly positive. We like definitely hit that goal and, and then some. Um, the benchmarks that we decided to use were the same ones that were used by Polars. Um, this is a TPCH, so TPC is a benchmarking organization, benchmarking committee that uh, publishes lots of different benchmarks. TPCH is often used for sort of database engines, and it's very heavy with joins and group buys, and we're also reading from Parquet. So mostly we're testing those sort of large, expensive operations. Uh, this is often where databases fail. And so it's a, it's a good test to check out sort of worst case performance. Um, these queries uh, look like this. Uh, this might be too small for you to see, I apologize, but it's a lot of read parquet and it's a lot of merges and then it's some group aggregations usually. For DAS data frame and polars, they're written as sort of data frame syntax with those two libraries APIs. The DAS data frame stuff looks just like pandas. And then for DuckDB and for Spark, we're using the SQL interface. Uh, so that's what's sort of shown here on the right. Um, and those are all available at uh, github.com slash coiled slash benchmarks in the TPCH directory. So we're also going to run those benchmarks in a few different computational contexts. First, we're going to run them on my MacBook Pro. Uh, so this is what's described on the left. My MacBook Pro is around two years old. It's got eight cores and an M1 chip. It's got 16 gigabytes of RAM, but it is also running a bunch of other stuff on that machine at the same time. I, for example, have Chrome running in the background. So it's not a clean environment, it's a messy environment, which I think is pretty indicative of how most sort of data professionals operate. Um, we're also gonna run on the cloud. And on the cloud, we, we're gonna use M6i uh, instances. Those are like the standard Intel instances on Amazon. Unfortunately, during the conference, uh, some company took up all of those instance types, so we switched up to M7i just because uh, availability was, was out. Um, this is the most prevalent instance type today. It's very standard. We're trying to be very boring. We're also going to check scale on my MacBook Pro. We're going to do both 10 gigabyte and 100 gigabyte. And then on cloud, we're going from 10 gigabyte all the way up to 10 terabytes, so a 1,000x scale difference. Um, we're going to keep the cost in the, on the cloud constant. So for example, we might use for DuckDB and Polars on the very largest scale, we we'll use the largest instance types we can find. That'll be you know, about 120 cores. For Dask and Spark, we'll still use 120 cores. We're going to split that up across you know, dozens of different machines, sort of two to four core instances. And that'll give us a good understanding of how to think about sort of the large single instance type instance versus the many instances and sort of the costs and benefits of both. So we'll get to see sort of distributed and uh, single machine uh, performance. 
So again, these are our projects. Uh, a quick note on bias. So I actually wrote a blog post about bias benchmarks a few years ago. Uh, and it's really, really hard to do benchmarks, honestly. Even if you have the best of intentions, you tend to choose benchmarks that you know you're gonna do well at. You tend to tune your own project far more than you tune other projects. You sort of only publish when the numbers are good. Um, you focus on where you're best. So for example, like in this, in this talk, I'm gonna focus mostly on cloud and mostly at large scale, because that's where I mostly care about. That's where all of our customers live. Um, but if the Polars or DuckDB people were to talk about this, they'd probably focus mostly on you know, more modest scales and more, mo mostly on sort of single machine on-prem cases. Uh, and also finally, like I'm really good at Dask. I'm probably better than you are at Dask. Certainly better than these other authors are. And I suck at things like Spark or Polars or DuckDB. Uh, and so it's just like, it's very hard to account for that uh, discrepancy in skill discrepancy and ability and facility with the tools. To address that, I've, I've actually been engaging with a few of the de other developers. Uh, so first, all the queries that we wrote, I didn't write, I actually stole them from Richie at Polars. They wrote a bunch of these queries, we just copy and pasted them. The data generation, we stole from DuckDB. Um, the benchmark suite is not our preferred benchmark suite. We actually don't find that pandas and Dask are often used for sort of big scalable joins. Um, I'm also avoiding any sort of sophisticated configuration options. I can get about a 2x speed up by doing very strange things with DAS that you wouldn't know to do. I'm not gonna do those. Um, also, we're collaborating. So this picture of me and Richie, the Polaris developer, that was taken at the conference uh, two days ago. Uh, we were actually working on Polaris on these benchmarks collaboratively, it was super fun. We got Polaris to be about like two to three times faster on S3 in the last few days, super fun. We also released Polaris a couple of times. Um, um, Richie would also like you to know that these tests use Polaris' streaming engine and not their in-memory engine. The streaming engine is quite new and it's not nearly as well optimized as the in-memory engine. Uh, Polaris is also just the, like the, the youngest library. It's had the fewest resources thrown at it. It's moving really fast. Super excited about Polaris. Their numbers will improve over time. For Spark, we're collaborating with a company, Sync Computing. Super fun company. They look at your Spark logs. Um, and then based on what they're seeing, they then could they then recommend to you a different configuration. A Spark configuration is like a black art that they've actually automated some, somehow. Uh, they like get people to reduce their Databricks bills by considerable amounts in sort of an automated fashion. Mostly we're chatting with a gentleman called Vinu. Uh, Vinu used to work at Palantir optimizing a lot of their customers' Spark workloads. Our initial attempts to configure Spark were very bad. Thanks to Vinu, they are less bad, but they may still be bad. Honestly, the Spark performance here is not what I'm expecting. I'm expecting Spark to perform way better than what I'm seeing. We'll see that a little bit later on. Um, so there's a lot of work for us to do here. I should also mention all this stuff started two weeks ago. So these are very preliminary results. Uh, we haven't had a whole lot of time to do this very thoroughly yet, but it's fun and exciting So we're sharing it early. DuckDB, honestly, DuckDB looks, out, looks pretty good in these uh, benchmarks, so I haven't actually reached out to them yet. I should though. DuckDB folks, I'll reach out to you soon. Um, okay, charts, that was the boring part. Thank you for suffering through that. Let's, through, look, let's look through results. So we're gonna start at local on 10 gigabyte. And honestly, Polars and DuckDB kick Dask and Spark's butt at this scale and in this context. So if you look here at, you know, so query two is really small. It's actually not particularly representative, but most of these queries, DuckDB is, you know, five to 10 times faster than Dask. Polars is a little bit slower than DuckDB usually, and Spark and Dask are, you know, sometimes one is faster than the other. Um, yeah, so in general, what we're seeing here is that if you're on a local machine and your data set is, is modest, 10 gigabytes, DuckDB and Polars will have you go faster, you know, one or two seconds rather than five to 10. As we shift up to 100 gigabytes, it gets more interesting because now the data set no longer fits in RAM. And so we're really testing the tool's ability to operate on largely memory data in a messy environment. Remember, I've got Chrome running in the background, taking up roughly half the RAM of my machine. Um, so Dask and DuckDB reliably run everything. The Dask, however, is generally slower than DuckDB. Uh, Polars and PySpark sometimes struggle. Uh, what I noticed with Polars is that it would start swapping to disk in a way that was bad. It would sort of take a while. 
Uh, Spark would start swapping and then would fail. I suspect I'm just misconfiguring Spark and Spark is expecting all of the hardware on the machine and it's not getting it and so it's unhappy. Um, but in general, they're like, this is where things get a little bit strange. The 10 gigabyte case, really calm, really easy, really sensible. 100 gigabyte case, it's a more messy environment. Um, let's switch back to 10 gigabyte and we're gonna look at cloud. So from local to cloud, everything normalizes out. So the, the benefit that Polars and DuckDB had of being really fast in memory engines goes away. I suspect, and we'll see, it's because we're now reading from S3. And S3 provides a bottleneck that makes the in-memory performance much less meaningful. Um, Polars does well across everything. I think actually is like usually winning, uh, except in, in query two, where there's like a, a bug that we introduced during development in the last couple of days. Um, I'm actually surprised at how well Dask performs against Spark. Uh, so in general, we're gonna see that DuckDB and Polars are relatively well correlated and Dask and Spark are relatively well correlated. The single machine and the distributed systems are similar to each other. I was pretty happy because I was expecting Dask to be a lot slower than Spark and it isn't, which was fun. It's not considerably faster. I wouldn't like change from Spark to Dask because of this 20% speed boost, but it's not a 5X difference. Um, so in general, everything is just a lot more flat on the cloud case at 10 gigabytes. I'm now gonna increase scale by a factor of 10 and we're gonna see how things change. At 10 gigabytes, uh, the distributed, or at 100 gigabytes, the distributed systems start showing the benefit of their scale a bit more. So Dask and Spark end up usually winning at this scale. Uh, DuckDB and Polars end up being a lot slower. And we're gonna see in a minute that they're just not using CPU that much. I actually could have run these on smaller instance types and would have had the same performance. Um, uh, Polars starts having trouble with a few of these queries at larger scales. Again, Polars not designed for sort of this size on the cloud. Uh, switching up now to a terabyte. Um, uh, Polar is mostly dropped out at this point. Um, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, PySpark oddly also drops out in a few cases. Um, this is again surprising me because we know that PySpark runs at this scale. Uh, I just wasn't able to configure things properly well enough. Shifting up to 10 terabytes, uh, PySpark will actually run these but not in the hour cutoff limit that I had for these benchmarks. Uh, DuckDB runs four out of the seven queries and then Dask finishes everything. Uh, Dask ends up being actually the most reliable across all the across all the ranges. That might just be because I'm running them now. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm gonna sort of let's dig into some analysis at at this point. Oh, I should also mention that we're we're limiting Dask and Spark. So like th these queries are taking you know half an hour to run. Dask and Spark can run them much faster than DuckDB and Polars can. They can run them faster than this but we're limiting Dask and Spark to uh, the same number of cores as DuckDB has. Uh, that's because Duck, and DuckDB is right now at the largest instance type I can get. So what the sort of the real power of Dask and Spark is that they can actually bring these down uh, if we add a lot more scalability, probably at the same cost too. We're just, we're just not doing that to, to, in order to try to keep things fair. But we're a little bit hampering Dask and Spark here from what they're really good at, which is operating at larger scale in order to speed things up. Okay, so those are some results. Again, all of those charts available at tpch.coil.io if you wanna go look for yourself. Um, also, all of the code is at github.com slash coiled slash benchmarks. This is all available on GitHub in the tests uh, tpch directory. And you can check to make sure that the query is running or all sensible. You can also look at all of the sort of setup code that we use to make sure everything is sensible. We would love help here if there's something that we're doing this wrong. All this runs which is with PyTest. It's very easy to run everything. Um, okay, so that was charts, super exciting. We're now gonna go into analysis. So uh, no tool wins consistently, right? Different scales and different computer environments call for different choices. We're now gonna try to investigate a little bit uh, what's going on so that you can make better choices. And so that library authors can think about where to optimize in the future. Uh, also, just like no one is anywhere near optimal in cloud. I'll briefly say that looking deeply at the DAS metrics, which I understand well, there's at least a two to five X speed improvement we can get. And we're like near the top on the cloud, 
which means that no one is operating well. Like nobody has optimized cloud well, as far as I can tell. So let's look at analysis. Uh, first, S3 bandwidth. S3 is really hard to do well, and it shows. I'm going to switch to looking at, so all these are running on Quilled. This is the Quilled UI. I'm going to go look at recent, um, recent tests. So let's look at TPCH. Uh, I'm going to look at, uh, I'm doing screen recording, and now my everything's a little slow. Uh, let's look at Dask. And so we're going to look at the previous Dask runs. I think I've got one actually up here. Yeah, so this is a Dask run. It was run on Monday. Um, and it's at scale 1,000. And we can see here uh, the seven queries that we ran and the kinds of act actions that we were taking during those times. And we can see the code that was active during each of those runs. And if we look at what hardware metrics are doing at that time, the most interesting thing here is network bandwidth. So query one is really interesting because it doesn't have any joins. It's really just reading parquet and doing group by aggregation. And I'm getting about 60 megabytes per second network bandwidth into each machine. So this is on a sort of a per machine basis. Now these are uh, M7i extra large instances. These are four core machines. And I can get anywhere from 200 to 500 megabytes per second coming in from S3 if I do just sort of basic uh, like toy examples. So this is about a, a five to 10x reduction in the performance that I think is possible. This was really surprising to me. Um, it does speed up a bit as I go on. Amazon seems to get sort of more comfortable giving you bandwidth S3 as you as you um, progress, as you start keep using a bucket from a machine a little more and more. Um, but in general, this like this let us down actually a bunch of questions into Arrow, actually the system that we use to download and uh, deserialize Parquet data. So there's actually a really interesting issue on the Arrow issue tracker where I go into where we go into all of these sort of benchmarks with the Arrow team. And we find that you know, on MacBook Pro, I can deserialize about a gigabyte per second, which is what I expect. And on uh, any Linux machine I can find, it operates about 150, 50 megabytes per second. That's just deserialization. There's more issues with downloading. Arrow to, like, actually isn't well tuned to operating at a high late, on, with a high latency system like S3. There's a lot of low hanging fruit here. The Arrow team is actually pretty excited about working on this. So, there's a lot of good improvements that we can make here. Um, we also noticed that this S3, so putting arrow to the side, just downloading data. S3 is bizarre. I can be downloading data for minutes, and then S3 suddenly decides to get more bandwidth, um, or it'll sort of burst up and down. S3 has all these sort of interesting bandwidth shaping rules that take over at various times. And so what I've learned is that actually performing well at these benchmarks is a lot about how, sort of how well you can treat S3. What's interesting is DuckDB, so this is DuckDB, same day, same scale. DuckDB is able to handle S3 far better than Dask is. Uh, so this is it's getting about a gigabyte per second, sort of the early queries, you know, 500 megabytes up to a gigabyte, up to about two gigabytes per second later on. Um, and that's, that's way better than we can get. Now to be fair, DuckDB is on a massive instance while we're on a lot of little small instances. So we expect to have, have better bandwidth. But this shows you sort of some of, something of what's possible. Um, if I look over at Spark, so this is Spark at the same scale, same day. Spark also gets a sort of like really poor band, actually a little bit worse than Dask, um, 40 megabytes, 30 megabytes per second. The difference with Spark though is that they are pinning their CPU while they're while they're serializing this. Um, they're actually like really, Spark is like oddly bad at performance. If you compare Spark with DuckDB, while DuckDB is downloading this data a gigabyte per second, the CPU is hardly moving. Um, let's go look at total. Right, so DuckDB has access to 128 core machine and it's using you know five or six cores during that time. We should also note that while DuckDB is able to get a gigabyte per second on a single node, systems like Dask or Spark, while they suck on a single node, they are still able, because they've got many nodes, they're able to get um, way more bandwidth. So while DuckDB is getting 500 to a gigabyte on a single node, in aggregate, we're getting you know, almost two. Later on, we're getting you know, about seven. As this is really showing you one of the advantages of distributed computing on the cloud. It's not that distributed computing is good for the computing part, it's that we're able to parallelize network access. And that's actually, I think, where 
Dask and Spark have a significant advantage at larger scale over these single machine systems. Um, just being able to use many small machines and spread bandwidth needs across those machines is probably going to have us win in the long term um, at these sort of larger queries at larger scale. Okay, I'm going to go back to slides. S3 is really weird. My experience is that just like optimizing around S3 is how you win. Dask does this terribly, but because we got distributed options and of course we're not as bad as some other things, uh, we do okay. Um, I also want to talk about sort of inner machine communication. So uh, let's go look at, so this is a performance report for the Dask workload at scale 100. We can see what Dask is doing over time. It's mostly reading Parquet. These green parts are both reading Parquet and doing a little bit of shuffling. And we're going to look at the uh, flame graph of the profile of all of the workers over time. If you don't know these plots, I apologize. I'm going to sort of exclude you for a minute. But this period of time is all reading Parquet. So this is all sitting in, uh, let's see, where is this? Uh, in sort of an arrow code reading data. And it's most of the time. This is, you know, 76% of our time. Uh, this bit over here, these two chunks, are in the sort of shuffle, join, sort stuff. This is when we're communicating between machines. So the, the challenge of distributed computing is that communication now becomes really expensive. And that's just taking up, you know, 6% plus 8%, maybe 15% total. That's where that's taking up. And then this bit over here is pandas. And Pandas is taking up about 6% of our time. This is a while ago. We've actually improved since then. This Parquet stuff is lower. These two bits are larger. But they're not a ton larger. Mostly what I'm communicating here is that our major bottleneck is Parquet and, and S3 access. Then it's shuffling. Then it's Pandas. When people talk about all these great in-memory performance things to make you know something faster than Pandas, the fact is it doesn't matter as much on the cloud. The pandas bit is not our bottleneck. We're really focused on S3 access and on shuffling and less on the pandas stuff. If anything is slow here on the Dask side, it's not pandas' fault. And if you want to make things faster, you don't need to think about you know, multi-threaded CPU access and avoiding memory copies. You need to think about treating S3 correctly and avoiding shuffles. Um, so let's move on. Yeah, except maybe with Spark. Spark is kind of weird. Um, I, I mentioned before that like the CPU utilization was really high with Spark, which was strange to me. Um, on, on just a single machine, when I'm running these things locally on my MacBook, Spark is actually the best at getting high CPU utilization. My CPU cores are just pinned at you know, 99, 95%, uh, despite Spark not going any faster than other people. Um, so Spark uses my cores really well, but it isn't faster. I asked uh, Vinu, our sort of Spark expert about this. I said, hey, look, Spark isn't good in good network performance. What are the right configuration options that I should be setting in order to tune Spark for network performance? And his answer surprised me. It was Spark optimization is all about CPU and memory use. Network isn't thought to be a bottleneck. Now that surprises me because for me, network bandwidth is like 100 to 500 megabytes per second on a modest node. And memory bandwidth is like 10 to 30 gigabytes per second. And so if you're doing this sort of CPU memory stuff at all efficiently, it should be nowhere near a bottleneck. You should be 100% bottlenecked by network stuff. And so it's it, it could be that Spark is just very CPU inefficient, which is why this never becomes a problem for them. Uh, but this is like, something must be wrong. Uh, I, I must not be configuring Spark correctly. Uh, however, the more I spend time with these Spark experts, and the, the more time they're unable to make Spark run faster, I'm becoming less convinced of that. So it's, it's a weird situation. The next step, honestly, for us is to go run on Databricks, on a system, a system that we know is well configured. So uh, another note, just so DuckDB performs admirably throughout all of this. From large scale to small scale, they do OK. At like the 10 terabyte scale, they mess up a little bit. That could be my fault. Um, but they're like probably best at small scale. They're you know respectable at large scale, uh, so kudos to the DuckDB team, great work. Um, Dask does okay. I'm putting my Dask hat a little bit. Um, we're bottlenecked by a few things: S3 and Arrow Parquet deserialization. But there's lots of room for improvement there. We're really excited about that. The shuffling stuff, but again, lots of room for improvement. The Dask team is working on that in the last few days, and eventually pandas. But we're not there 
the point where pandas make sense yet. Um, that's actually really exciting to me because I think we can actually probably improve our numbers by two to four X, maybe more. And that could be great. That could be, you know, Dask could be a system that has, you know, some fraction of the performance of DuckDB, but the scalability of Spark. And that would be a very, very powerful place for us to be. So last part of the talk uh, deployment, we're going to try to sell you some stuff. So we ran all of this, all of these benchmarks we ran on Coiled. So Coiled is a company that was based around Dask. We, Dask is great, but it's hard to deploy. We made a company that made it easy to deploy Dask. Um, uh, and it turns out that it's, it's uh, doing that well is a lot about just making it really easy to deploy stuff in the cloud in a way that's, that's sort of pleasant and fun to use. Uh, we made a system that is pleasant and fun to use, more pleasant and fun than alternative technologies. Um, it turns out you can actually use that system to deploy other things too. So uh, I'll just show you how we how we ran all of this stuff, Dask, DuckDB, Polar, Spark, Uncoiled. Um, yeah, so very briefly, I'm gonna run this live. It's more fun live. So very briefly, uh, if I want to create a cluster of 100 machines with some architecture, uh, I can go and I can you know ask Coil to make a cluster with that with that configuration, and Coil will go and do that, and it'll do that on the fly for me in about a minute. Um, so right now, what it's doing is it is looking at my local environment. It's figuring out what Python packages I have, what scripts I've got locally, what Amazon credentials I have, and it's shipping all that up to the cloud. Um, it then is provisioning 100 machines, right? So we're now asking Amazon. Hey, make these machines for me and give them you know, these these configurations, um, and give me a secure direct line to those machines. So this is what Coil does. It then sets up a Dask cluster running on those machines and give the, gives me the access to them. Uh, super lightweight, super easy to use. You can configure everything from Python. It goes up and down in about a minute, so it uh, you don't leave machines idling. It's a very different experience from like Databricks or other technologies which are a little bit slower and a little bit more, um, require more configuration, require more sort of upfront static um, decision-making. Uh, Coiled is otherwise is alternatively very, uh, very pleasant. Uh, so there, I just made a cluster in you know, less than a minute. And it has all the same conda packages, .py files, Amazon credentials that I've got on my laptop. I'm running this all from my Mac mini right now. Coiled is so easy to use that we found people misusing it in a few ways. Instead of creating a cluster with 100 machines, they were creating clusters with one machine. And instead of running big data frame computations, they were running single Python functions on those machines. We were confused by that. And so it turned out that they mostly were just using us um, as kind of like a big Amazon Lambda service. We were sort of easier to use in Amazon Lambda. We also allowed people to, um, to run on any kind of hardware. They could get GPUs, they could get big memory machines. It's also a lot cheaper rather than sort of the 10X costs increase that Amazon Lambda costs, we charge about 2X. So we actually sort of uh, leaned into that and we made this API coiled functions, which just does the Dask cluster with a single worker thing in the background. But it's really easy to use, people don't, uh, they don't know. They don't have to care much about how to configure stuff. They don't have to know anything about Dask. Um, and again, this is uh, this is bad because it takes about a minute for the first time you invoke your function. Uh, but it's good because you use any hardware or software. It's a lot cheaper than Lambda, and it's sort of just very good for sort of bulk data processing or for GPUs. In particular, people use it a lot where there's a map method. They just process you know 10,000 S3 buckets, S3 files in a bucket. Um, we found like it's. You know, there's maybe like 20% of our commercial use today. It's sort of, but it's growing quickly. It's fun. So this is how, oh, lots of fun applications you can do with it. If you want like a GPU, it's easy to get a GPU in your MacBook. But this is how we ran DuckDB and Polars. So uh, inside of our PyTest test suite, there's tests that use DuckDB, for example. And those tests are just annotated with coiled function. And we sort of specify the sort of hardware we want based on the um, configuration we're, we're running with. So it's super easy. And if you want to run Polars or DuckDB on the cloud, this is a pretty trivial way to do it. Uh, so we had Dask because Coil does Dask. We had DuckDB and Polars because we run on a single machine. Super easy. Now the question is, how do we actually run Spark? How do we, you know, 
uh, how do we run Spark in a distributed way on Amazon or GCP? And it turned out, we're looking at EMR, the sort of Amazon solution, or, or Databricks. It turned out it was easier for us to reinvent EMR and to sort of learn how to use it. And so we made uh, a get Spark um, method, uh, which just you create a cold cluster and we can deploy Spark on that cluster as well as we can deploy Dask. Uh, we use a technology called Spark Connect to give you direct access to your, your laptop. It's like Livy for folks who remember that, but better. Um, and you get all the same the nice features that Quilt has. You get the cool dashboards we were seeing earlier. You get fast startup in about a minute. Um, you get automatic software syncing with all your local libraries. It's cool. Um, I used to say this is a little insecure because Spark Connect is not secure. We've actually solved that since writing these slides. So anyway, if you want to run Spark on Amazon and you want to use Quilt for some reason, go ahead. Um, great. Um, so briefly at the end, quick pitch, DAS data frame. I think Pandas is still cool. People think of Pandas as being sort of the old technology that is slow. It is slower, but not by as large as you probably think it is slower. And at scale, it might actually be faster when combined with Dask. Um, so nice things about Dask data frames is that it was reliably fast-ish. It was never horribly slow. Um, it actually ran all the queries. Again, that might be because it was me running the queries rather than one of the other maintainers. Um, it was the fastest at larger scale, but probably we're being dumb somehow with Spark. Spark should be in the running still there still. Um, and Dask also has a lot of room for improvement, right? I think there's like a lot of things that we can make faster over the next two to five weeks. So I'm excited to run these benchmarks again to give you an update at that time. Also Dask Data Frame, because it's just pandas, has probably the most familiar API, which matters a lot for a lot of people. There's no sort of retraining of a workforce. So. I think a goal for us as DAS developers is to get within a factor of, you know, two to five of DuckDB and Polars, but with the scalability of Spark. And that's, I think, a very achievable goal that puts us in an interesting place. So I'm excited to sort of strive towards that goal. Hopefully you're excited about that too. Um, brief pitch for Coiled. You should use us, pay us money. Um, the cloud can be easy and cheap. It was actually really fun to write all of this stuff and the cloud infrastructure wasn't the hard part. Uh, the cloud is only easy and cheap if you use it well. Coiled makes it pretty easy to use it well. And hopefully the stuff around Coiled functions makes that obvious. So um, that's it. Uh, you should use Coiled. You should try out these benchmarks. I'm actually going to leave you with a call to action of go to github.com, Coiled benchmarks, look at the test TPCH directory, and tell us if there's anything that we think we're doing wrong. Um, yeah. And if you want to play around, come play around. Thanks, everyone.